This is the first of five videos on phylogenetic reconstruction. Uh, today we're just going to, in this video, we're just going to introduce the topic. All right, so phylogenetic reconstruction. We have already talked about uh, different ways of doing classification systems, and we have shown that the cladistic or phylogenetic approach really has the strongest biological and philosophical foundation for figuring out evolutionary relationships. So the question then becomes, how do we actually infer phylogenies? Uh, there are a very, very small number of speciation events that human beings have actually witnessed. The vast majority, millions of them, uh, have not been witnessed. And so how are we going to infer the actual set of evolutionary relationships of species? Today we're going to look at just one of the methods. It's called parsimony. Um, and there are methods besides parsimony. There are ways of doing things by what we call distance measures, maximum likelihood, uh, and something called Bayesian inference. Those last two are statistical approaches. Um, and they're very important, but we don't have time to consider them all, so we're going to focus on parsimony because it's more straightforward. All right, so the goal of phylogenetics, if you haven't guessed it already, is to recreate the ancestor-descendant relationships among species. Uh, so our goal is to build phylogenetic trees. And this is necessarily going to be a branching pattern, uh, and this should make sense to you based on the uh, discussion we've already had on speciation, because usually we have an original parental species that divides into two or more additional species, uh, and so that's going to create a branching pattern when we represent this graphically. Uh, we've also talked about the fact that you can have reticulate evolution, hybrid speciation, but we're going to be ignoring that for uh, this part of the class. All right, so first, let's make sure we understand how to read and uh, interpret phylogenetic trees. So trees have different parts. Most trees are rooted trees, so the base of the tree is what we call the root here. It's where things begin. Um, and then whenever we have a speciation event, we have what we call a node. So here, this branch represents uh, an ancestral species, and then that splits into two new species represented by these branches. Now, if you ever talk to uh, somebody in computer science, they will call these branches edges, um, but they mean the same thing that we do when we call them branches. And then here at the tips of the tree, we have what are called either leaves or taxa or species. Um, and so these are the uh, different organisms that we're trying to reconstruct the relationships for. Now, another thing that can be tricky about reading phylogenetic trees is that uh, the order uh, at which things appear on the tips often actually means absolutely nothing. Uh, what really matters when we're dealing with a phylogenetic tree is the relationships of things through the actual branches on the tree. And so one way to think about this is that each node on the tree can spin. Now before we get to that, let's look at one other thing here. This dimension on the tree is time, all right? So time is flowing from the root up to the tips where we have our present day species. This dimension here, however, actually means nothing. It's just there so that we can see the relationships of the species. If we made a phylogenetic tree one dimensional, only had this dimension on it, then all of these branches would lay down on top of each other and we wouldn't be able to see the relationships. So we use this axis here to spread things out so we can see the relationships, but it doesn't tell us anything at all about how closely related to things, uh, how closely related different species are to one another. So for example here, B is not more closely related to C than it is to D. It's actually equally related to C and D. And the reason for that is if you, trace, if you trace through this tree, you go through the same set of common branches to get to C from B as you do to go from B to get to D. And this is something really important to remember. Now, one way to think about this is to think of every single node on the tree as being a pivot, and you can spin around that pivot. So for example here, let's look at this node. You could imagine these branches literally spinning around each other uh, on that node. So as a practical matter, what that means is that this tree, where we have A, B, C, D, is exactly the same as this tree, 
where we have A, B, D, C. All we did was spin around this 180 degrees here. But these two trees topologically are exactly the same. There's no difference even though they look different to your eye. Similarly in this tree, we could also spin the entire tree around this node at the root here. So we could spin it like this, which means that this tree, A, B, C, D, is exactly the same as this tree here, D, C, B, A. All we did was took that original tree and spin it 180 degrees around that node. So here's an interesting exercise for you. You can always, uh, on this next slide, these three trees all depict exactly the same evolutionary history. Um, they're just variations on each other by spinning the tree around uh, different nodes that it has. And if you want to figure that out for yourself, just pause the, uh, the demonstration here and, and work that out for yourself. All right, one last thing about interpreting phylogenetic trees. Sometimes branch length means something in phylogenetic trees, and sometimes it doesn't mean anything at all. When it doesn't mean anything at all, we make what are called cladograms, and that's what this is over here. This is a cladogram. The cladogram gives us branching orders, but the branch lengths themselves don't mean anything. So for example, here we've got these two species, and we know that they evolved after this speciation event here for these three species. But the branch lengths are not telling us how long it's been since any of those events, just the order in which they occurred. Now alternatively, we can say that branch lengths mean something. So that's when we have these things called phenograms, and that's what's presented over here. In this case, the branch lengths do mean something. So here, there's been more change on this long branch here than there's been, for example, on this short branch over here. So cladograms tell us branching order, but they don't tell us the timing or how much change there's been. Phenograms do give us branching order, just like cladograms, but they also tell us how much time or how much change there's been on each branch.